My name's Mike Chanchuk, and you're listening to Pro Lacrosse Talk. On Schreiber. Snyder with scores! Now it's Mike Pinnell scores! Paul Rabel splits two and scores! Kylie O'Miller showing off those shifty skills. Kelly, not shy, bounces one home! What a start! Welcome to Pro Lacrosse Talk, the voice of Pro Lacrosse. I'm Hutton, he's Adam, and together we're bringing you interviews with your favorite players and coaches, as well as news from all four professional lacrosse leagues. Stoked to have you guys for another episode of Pro Lacrosse Talk. We are fresh off the heels of the PLL Championship in Philly. Adam, what's going on today? I'm good, man. Have a lot to talk about today. Uh, got some MLL coverage to talk about, the huge weekend for the PLL. I'm excited to get going. Yeah, no, and we got our, we're going to announce our fantasy lacrosse winner, um, the winner of both Week 3 and the grand prize winner who will be taking home those epic lacrosse gloves. Like you said, a lot to talk about, but as we always start off with, let's go into our fast break. Starting with the MLL, um, the final week of the regular season in Game 1 on Friday, the Bayhawks defeated the Outlaws 13-11 to to secure the number one overall seed going into the playoffs. Game 2, the Rattlers defeated the Cannons to end their season on a high note, winning 16-15. to And in the final game of the weekend, the Lowly Lizards weren't so lonely, uh, and they defeated the Blaze 21-15 to end the regular season. In the PLL, in the game to see who would win the first overall draft pick, uh, the Archers defeated the Atlas decisively 25-7. to And in the inaugural PLL championship, it went into overtime, was a fantastic game between the Whipsnakes and Redwoods, and the Whipsnakes came out victorious 12-11 to to get the first crown in PLL history. Yeah, no, you mentioned that. First ever PLL championship. It was exciting. I was there in person with our videographer, Tom Walton, who did an excellent job getting some video content for us. So be on the lookout for a highlight reel and as well as our tailgate trivia segment coming out later this week. But yeah, let's actually start off with this PLL draft game. Um, obviously, a real snooze fest with the Archers scoring 25-7 to against the Atlas. This one was really never in doubt um, from the get-go. Uh, Will Manny ends up setting the record for most points with 11. He had seven goals and four assists in this one. Uh, he was big if you had him on your fantasy lacrosse team. We'll get into that a little bit later. But, yeah, I think what was obvious here is Trevor Baptiste is at the indoor lacrosse championships uh, right now. He was not at the game. They went with Brent Hyken, uh, who this was his first PLL game. He went 23.5% at the faceoff X, so obviously – a, a bit, very abysmal day for him, but you know, kudos to him for you know finally getting his shot. The league's very competitive, so I don't think it's really a knock on Hiking. I just think it shows that the guys at the top are extremely elite, and I think it shows how lacking the Atlas actually are without Baptiste. And you know, I was saying that he could easily have been MVP for them. You know, him and Jack and Cannon being the consistent uh, base for them all season and you remove one of them, and it's you know a complete blowout, the worst in PLL history so far. So disappointing for the Atlas to go out. Um, but the Archers get that number one pick. Um, and I, you know, looking back on it, I had a discussion with somebody, and it made me think, you know, you have this number one pick, and I, I get that they want to have someone, a team earn it. The point of the draft game was to prevent tanking. That's understandable. But you have a playoff team now getting the top overall draft, where the Chrome are going to be sitting at three, still a good draft spot, but... I think them and the Atlas desperately need that number one pick more than the Archers do, and you kind of rewarded a better team. Um, you know, I get the Archers had to win two games to get there, but I don't know. What are your thoughts, Adam? Do you think it's still fair how they do this uh, draft game format? Yeah, you know what? I think at the moment, we, we might have discussed this uh, a few weeks ago, but I, I'm okay with the format at the moment just because there are so many other areas um, to the off season that are up in the air. Uh, if it comes down to it that this is the format going forward if there are going to be this amount of teams going into next year and they keep this format from now on I can't see how a team at the bottom is going to succeed if that makes sense you know they the, the a team that made the playoffs now has the first overall pick um, so they're 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 set to go into next year um, even more loaded potentially than they were this year, whether it's TD, whether it's one of the offensive guys that we, we've talked about in previous weeks. Um, it's going to be super interesting to see what the releases um, that Paul talked about, Paul Rabel talked about um, after the championship. He said, keep po keep uh, looking at the Twitter to see news that's going to be released systematically over the next few weeks and, and the regular season to see how things go. 
it's up in the air to me. To my, my, my opinion at the moment is I want to wait to see, to be honest with you, um, what the off season looks like before uh, I make a total judgment. But if, if you're looking at it, just blanket statement like you were talking about, I'm nervous uh, for disparity in the league. Yeah, no, we're going to, you know, talk a little bit about the off season following our championship recap. But, um, yeah, no, I, I, I don't know. I guess my point is, again, like a playoff team won the top overall draft pick. So I, I appreciate them trying to avoid tanking, but I still don't think they're giving those bad teams enough of a chance. So, you know, maybe next year I'd like them to do, uh, maybe you just have the Atlas play the Chrome in one of these games for the top pick. You know, you don't introduce sure. the uh, fourth playoff team. Um, and then you seed it that way, and you, you leave maybe championship weekend up to just the final game because I think people were excited to see. You know, you obviously had like Joey Sankey, a Philly guy, playing yeah. in that game, so you know people were excited for that game still, but it didn't have that same atmosphere uh, that the championship game did. So I think you know maybe they benefit just giving the championship its own weekend, um, you know, for everyone to enjoy. I think you'd still get a great turnout regardless. Sure. But you know what? It is what it is. The Archers had the top pick. So what do you think they're going to do with that pick, Adam? I still think at the moment it's most likely going to be TD Ireland coming out um, and, and, and taking over the face-off spot for them. Uh, but it's, it's really open-ended, and to be honest with you, how most drafts, whether it's pro lacrosse or, or basketball or whatever it may be, it really comes down to the play of the collegiate season. And, and we have a lot of top performers um, that are, are still in college that are going to be seniors. This is, this is a stacked draft um, going in into the, um, their senior seasons. And um, whether it's Jeff T, Michael Sowers, I mean, Michael Sowers ha has been considered a top player for like the last two years. So is this the year that he absolutely destroys it and comes back, takes um, Princeton to the Ivy League playoffs, and potentially makes the tournament on solely on his back, and 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 we, the we have a kind of change in topic and uh, in in a variety of different ways. So I honestly, at the moment, gun to my head, I think they take Ireland, but I think we have to wait to see what the college season brings before really making that decision. No, you're right. There's so many what ifs. I mean, does Pat Spencer come back? If Pat Spencer comes back, I think TD's a lock for them to take because I think, you know, they do need help at the faceoff. I think Stephen Kelly proved that he could be a valuable asset for a team, but he might not be the guy. But if Spencer doesn't come back, I don't know. Maybe they take a Sowers or they take an Amon um, just because, you know, I think they are missing that X attack when you have Holman and Manny are these lethal shooters and, you know, off-ball finishers. And, you know, Sankey has done a decent job and Cuccinello has kind of come into his own. Um, but I still think you, you need a guy there that's really going to run that offense. So if they don't end up getting Pat Spencer, you know, you could see a little bit of a, a shakeup uh, with who they take. Um, and honestly, I think Kelly proved that he deserves to, you know, at least get an, another chance next year. You know, he, he ended up still around 50% at the end of the day. Um, obviously, he had two big weeks back-to-back uh, -back recently to kind of, you know, prove that he still, you know, is an elite face-off guy. But, you know, maybe they trade him to the Redwoods who – um, has you know struggled with injuries to Greg Gorenlian, and who knows if this next year is going to be his last year. It seemed like from social media that he is going to come back next year, but we don't know that. Uh, at least it would not help them to have somebody in the wings, um, you know, in case that he can't go next year. So, um, yeah, again, like you said, way too many what ifs. Uh, we'll definitely have more of an intense breakdown as the off season rolls around, and as we have a better idea of what the off season is, but. For now, you know, that's kind of our thoughts. Yeah, and I, I will just add one more thing in there. The the Archers attack combined for 28 points this weekend, right? And if they add a guy like Pat Spencer, um, I could absolutely see him, them going uh, to the midfield side of things with a guy like Doc Saken. But um, definitely a lot to think about. Yeah, no, and I think that's another great pick because they, you know, you saw the lack of Schreiber, um in the last game, they did kind of struggle a little bit at the midfield, and not as much as the against the Atlas. But yeah, I think that's also another worthy guy you, you want to take. So very interesting. Uh, once we have a better idea of the off season, we'll have a better idea how we can break it down. But those are our thoughts from the draft game. Let's get to the main event, which was the PLO Championship. A phenomenal game. I mean, you, you really couldn't have asked for a better game. Um, and it, you know, it it was pretty even. It was pretty tight early on. Obviously, you know, the Whip Snakes ended up with a five one lead. Uh, late into the second quarter, and then that Brent Adams shot from midfield ended up hitting off of Westberg and going in. So that kind of gave the Redwoods a little bit of life. They only went into the half down 5-2. Um, but then 
it was all whip snakes that third quarter at the beginning. They ended up getting off to a 7-2 lead, and then uh, it ended up being 9-2 off a Mike Chanachuk two-pointer. Uh, I talked to Mike Chanachuk's dad before the game at the whip snakes tailgate. Um, we're doing a little trivia with him. You guys can see that later on when our video releases. But uh, he was pretty confident his son was going to sink another two-pointer, and he sure did. Um, and at that point, you know, the press box itself, everyone was still level-headed, but I was looking on Twitter, and there was a lot of rumblings that the Whip Snakes were going to run away with it. And I was just thinking in the back of my mind, it's Premier Lacrosse. It's lacrosse in general, you know. It's a game of runs. You can never count anybody out. And sure enough, Jack Near uh, had that phenomenal on-brand crease dive that, you know, gave them that spark. Yeah. Then they got a goal from Sergio Perkovic. Then they, they ended up riding that momentum. Uh, all the way and eventually came back and tied it up. And then it was funny that every whip snake goal was scored by a Terp uh, in this game. And obviously they have a lot of Maryland players. But the guy who went to Maryland, not on the whip snakes, uh, ended up having the go-ahead goal for the Redwoods, and that was Joe Walters late with a minute 30 left. Uh, he did the Gladiator, our United Entertain celebration. And honestly, I knew it wasn't over, but I, at that point I was a little concerned for the whip snakes because – the Redwoods had all the momentum. And, you know, you can't fault the Redwoods for, you know, slowing it down and after they won that ground ball and they got possession and, you know, they ran out the clock as much as they could. Um, and, you know, Jules almost buried a behind-the-back shot. That would have been the dagger. Um, but you just kind of felt, you know, them kind of just stalling. It, it, it was almost like they were just letting the whip snakes hang around. I get, you know, that's what you got to do. Um, you know, you're not going to be super aggressive. You want to run the clock out as much as you can. And um, so I don't think I fault the Redwoods and Coach Nat St. Laurent at all for what they did. And a tremendous effort by their defense to kind of, you know, stifle that Whip Snakes offense that had really given them trouble a lot all day. I thought you saw both teams' unique styles on defense. Um, obviously, you have the Redwoods who are known to switch on picks, but also let their guys kind of play out on that island and they don't slide early, where the Whip Snakes were sliding early and often. Um, you know, and that kind of you know, hurt Ryder and, and Jules early on. They were you know, beating their man, but right when they turned their back, there was a, a slide that was there you know, to meet them. So um, I thought you, know, you could have asked for a better defensive game. Both goalies in cage played well. Tim Troutner had, was lights out. Cal Burnlor you know, also had a phenomenal game. They both finished really strong. Tim Troutner had 52.1% save percentage. Uh, and Burnlore himself had 61.5% save percentage. And, you know, they had some crucial goals. And even the, the, the ones that they let up sometimes were just nothing they could do about it. Burnlore saved one right on the crease uh, that Wes Berg, the magician, happened to grab and dunk right on top of him. So, you know, I think the goalies played phenomenal. Um, you couldn't ask for a better game. And back to the, the ending, though. So the, the Whip Snakes get the ball back around 20 seconds left. Coach Staggs calls a timeout. They gave it to their guy, Matt Rambo, who had been assisting on all these goals all day. He had three assists at that point in the goal. Um, he was doing a great job of when they were switching on picks, getting those shorty matchups, but also making the most of them because he wasn't beating his shorty matchups. He was almost baiting them to slide to him and then feeding right away. So um, I, I thought he did a phenomenal job. Uh, you know, all day. I mean, and he ends up, you know, getting that game tying goal uh, and sends it into overtime. A fitting end for a PLL championship to send it to overtime. I, again, I know Paul and Mike couldn't have asked for a better game. Um, Whip Snakes get the ball back. No timeouts though, so they're they're uh, you know they're just try putting it in the hands of their their offense because uh, there's no timeouts in overtime for the PLL. Um, and Rambo takes takes Landis and he just buries one where Troutner had no chance. You know, off hip. And I, that crowd went berserk, and the, the stadium was electric. And you know, all of us in the press box, like, couldn't believe the ending to have a Philly native uh, not only get the game tying goal, but the game winning goal uh, in the PLL inaugural championship. Um, but yeah, that that was your PLL championship. I mean, you couldn't have asked for a better one. Uh, what do, I know, Adam, you you unfortunately couldn't make it, but you you watched it. What did you think of the the final? If if you told me before the season that two of the best squads, one that was at the top of the leaderboards all year, one was able to scrap their way in, then the championship ended up being those two teams against one another, a back and forth contest, one team took a big lead, the other team came back, and it went into overtime. 
I, I don't think you could write a better storybook ending for the uh, an inaugural season for the league. So um, it was the perfect ending to a fantastic season for a league that is going up from here. And I'm just so excited to see what the off season brings uh, for for the league. And but what a what a storybook ending for the Philly guy to to end it. You know, a solid gritty. 12-11 lacrosse game, and I don't think you could ask for a better one. Um, but after the game, I actually spoke to Garrett Apple, uh, kind of just talk about you know how they were able to get that momentum back um, and kind of lock down the Whip Snakes for in that third, in the end of that third quarter, and the most of the fourth quarter to kind of make that comeback. Uh, so let's take a listen to what he had to say. All right, uh, Garrett, obviously a tough way to end this one. How do you guys think you responded and really resurged in the end of that uh, third quarter and the fourth quarter? Yeah, I mean, you can tell, like, a lot of our guys have character, man. We were down, we're not out, we're down seven goals with, like, six minutes left, whatever it was. And we came back, we, did, we always thought we had a chance. We crawled all the way back in the game, we got up, and then it just came down to one or two plays at the end, and they uh, took advantage of it. You know, what did you take away from this season and how your Redwoods really, you know, performed? So we're, we're a real team, um, you know, all over the field. We got a ton of older guys, leaders. Guys in the middle, you know, and young guys that are all coming together all around us. We're, we're the definition of a true team, you know, and uh, showed out there today how we came back and clawed back. So, you know, I'm proud of all our guys, how they played, but, you know, I'm pushing to take our way. Yeah, so great stuff from Garrett Apple. Phenomenal season for him. Um, disappointing, you know, how it ended up for the Redwoods. But um, after, I also talked to a bunch of whip snakes, including Coach Stagnita, who we had just spoke to last week. Um, and he won his first ever championship at any level. So like he had mentioned in our podcast, he had been in numerous Final Fours, uh, a few finals as well at many different levels. He had never won it before, and that was his first championship. So uh, congrats to Coach Staggs, and let's listen to what he had to say about the win. Here with Coach Staggs, how's it feel to win your first championship in any level? It feels a lot better than being on the other side of it. Um, and again, it's, you know, it's always nice when you can win it with this type of guys. I mean, they've, you know, they've been so much fun to be around all year, and They've continued to do this, right? They've continued to, you know, to fight back, and it's not always consistent or pretty. But you know, when we were in these situations, we've always found a way to, you know, to fight back, and we did. I mean, you know, minute ten left. I don't know. If there's a lot of people thought we were going to win that game. You know, we it was a little bit like a lot of our year. You know, we had stretches of brilliance, and you know, then some times where, you know, I, I mean, I think sometimes the ball just didn't bounce our way. We made some great plays, and but also opened some stuff up for them. But you got to give them a lot of credit. They're talented. They're scrappy, they're tough, and, you know, everybody comes back in this league. And so, you know, we were inconsistent, which, you know, I think, you know, allowed them back in the game at times. But at the same time, you know, we, we hit some pipes and, you know, missed some opportunities. And, you know, the bottom line is you need to be one goal better than the other team at the end of the day. Yep. And fitting that you win on an overtime uh, yeah. goal. But, uh, Coach, thank you so much. Uh, best of luck and have fun celebrating. My pleasure. And following Coach Stagnita, I also talked – the MVP himself of the league and the game, Matt Rambo, um, as well as Mike Chanichuk and John Haas, who each had a hat trick on the day, and Jake Bernhardt, who it was very special for because he had, as we talked about on his, our podcast with him, lost his father earlier this summer, so it was a very special moment for him. But let's hear what all these whip snakes had to say about the win. I'm here with Matt Rambo. Matt, you just won the PLL championship thanks to a goal that tied it to send it to overtime and then your game-winning goal. How's it feel? It's a uh, dream come true, especially in my hometown. Couldn't be more proud of these guys. You know, Kyle Byrne, Lauren, the defense, stops us all the time. I'm just so happy for this team and everyone right now. And how do you think Philly showed out today with the crowd? Um, if you weren't watching on TV, man, this place was electric, the loudest crowd yet this year. Um, they were all over the stand. This venue is amazing. Philly's the best, so I'm just so happy to be in my hometown. Well, awesome. Congratulations on the MVP award and on the PLL championship. Right. Go, go enjoy celebrating. I appreciate it. All right, so I'm here with Mike Chanichok. You had, you know, your 10th two-point goal of the year. Uh, your dad actually predicted you have another one earlier today. How's it feel to, you know, um, kind of be the two-point champion? And obviously it's not about individual success, but, you know, you kind of have that spot down on lock outside the arc. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it feels awesome. Um, like you said, it's, you know, individual kind of statistic. But, you know, for me to be able to help my team on a consistent basis hitting those, those shots, 
uh, obviously, it, you know, it stretches the D a little bit and, um, you know, it works hand-in-hand -hand with the attack, giving them a little more space and, you know, they get to, you know, bang it up top to me once in a while. So it, it's an awesome feeling and, you know, an achievement that I'm pretty proud of. How's it feel to, to win it all in the inaugural season of the PLL? Uh, it feels amazing uh, for a couple of reasons. One, um, obviously, inaugural season to be, to go down history as the first champs is, is pretty cool. We're going to be in the record books forever. Um, you know, two, I got to do it with... Uh, a group that I really love um, with a lot of Maryland guys and obviously the Whip Snakes team you know has come together over the season but a lot of us fell short in our, our college career so it was great to finally get one um, and you know it, it just taking it all in right now and you know we're gonna enjoy this and you're here in Philly uh, venue was great the turnout was great how's it feel you know in this atmosphere to win this championship <laughs> yeah you know this this reminds me of playing in a final four um, with thousands and thousands of people here I mean you know even when the Redwoods were making their comeback the place was rocking and you know the energy was unbelievable um, you know it's been like that all season but you know this this uh, championship was really something special so I'm here with John Haas uh you know, everyone's going to talk about the, the Rambo's two goals in the late, but, you know, you're kind of the unsung hero on this game as well. You had a hat trick, uh, including two back-to-back -back goals. Uh, how does it feel to win the PLL championship? It's uh, It truly is amazing um, for it to be the first year, too, and be the first champion ever. Um, you know, it puts all that hard work that all of us have, have continued to put in, um, you know, leading up into this year and, and the years before. Uh, it puts it all in perspective, and, and to finally win a, a professional uh, championship ha has been a dream come true. That's awesome. And, you know, the atmosphere is great here in Philly. What do you think of the, the venue? It's awesome. It is. Uh, this venue is phenomenal. Um, I actually, my first year um, in the MLL, um, I played in the, in the championship game here, and unfortunately I lost. So to come back uh, right now and actually win one uh, was tremendous. I think Philly does a phenomenal job. Um, played here th this past year in the Final Four with Penn State, um, and I thought they did a tremendous job of showing out and being here in support. And I also think they've done a, done a wonderful job today. Awesome. Well, congratulations. I uh, enjoyed the win. You know, we've been in a lot of these situations with these guys over the years at Maryland or pro teams, and you know, we have some of us haven't closed it out, and it's nice to maybe put some closure to that and get the guys a you know championship, which many of them uh, deserve. You know, first one uh, in history of PLL, and you know, just had to persevere and kind of buckle down. And um, you know, there's a lot of good teams, and you know, the Redwoods gave us their best shot, and you know, all the credit to them. I mean, you know, these are the best players in the world, and. I wasn't expecting anything less uh, from the Redwoods, and you know, I'm just proud of our, our group and Coach Staggs and all the coaching staff, and it was just an awesome year. Yeah, so really great stuff. Uh, a storybook ending for a lot of these guys who, other than, you know, say Connor Kelly and Matt Rambo, you know, played at Maryland and played in some of these championships and, and came up short. So for them to play with a lot of fellow alumni and get this win in the PLL, I think it was very special for them. You know, obviously Mike Chanichuk talked about it and John Hall, so... Um, you know, a very special uh, moment for a lot of these guys, and, you know, kudos for them for getting it done and, you know, giving us such a phenomenal game. But the last person I talked to before leaving the field uh, was Mike Rabel, the CEO of the league himself. And so let's listen to what he had to say about not just the game, but, you know, what he thought of the season as a whole from the PLL. All right, so I'm here with Mike Rabel, CEO of the PLL. Uh, how do you think this first season went? And, you know, to have it come down to overtime, could you ask for a better uh, championship? Well, you can never ask for a better championship if it doesn't come down to overtime. And so they did. I just, For me, it's about the players, um, and these guys deserve this. They deserve to be on national television. They deserve to um, be treated the way they are. Um, and, you know, they give back to you when you treat them the way they deserve. And, you know, I've been talking to a lot of guys, and they've been saying that they finally feel like uh, how they did in college again, and if not better, and that's something we're going for. And, you know, that's, that's the biggest reward is that we're elevating the, the game, we're elevating the sport, so more people realize how beautiful this sport is, more people realize how hard these guys work, what incredible athletes they are, um, and then more people will start playing and more people will start paying attention to the game. Absolutely. And what did you think of this venue, you know, being in Philly, where a lot of national championships have been held? Uh, what did you think of the turnout today? I mean, I got to see the numbers, but I think I got, I got to say it was the highest we've ever had. I haven't seen the total scans yet. People come in all the way to the fourth quarter from uh, the parking lot, but I mean, Philly completely showed out. Um, it was way bigger than we were expecting. Uh, they were totally loud. They had a good split between Redwoods fans and Whip Snakes fans. People were cheering, had signs, doing chants. I mean, I haven't heard it that loud. I've never heard it that loud. Yeah. Um, and that's what you. That's what you want. And people are picking their teams. You're sticking with them, um, and they're going to be those teams' uh, fans for life. Really, I just think that like the, the players and the coaches. 
and our staff are just all incredible people. They work really hard. They're selfless. They bought in from the beginning in training camp, and we said we're going to go out there and compete. We're all in it together. And we're elevating the game, and I can't wait till next year comes around because there's going to be a lot more exciting things. Um, we're in the business of over-delivering. We're over-delivering for our sponsors, our staff, our players, and our coaches, and our fans. And that's what we do. So this is an incredible year. We didn't think it necessarily we could ever get to this place, and it's just starting. So, yeah, really great stuff from Mike. He was obviously like, super excited, and like he said, he they couldn't have asked for a better game and uh, a better season, and they're excited to you know, keep growing uh, the, the league as they progress. Paul Rabel also went on, and he spoke about where the league was headed right after the game, and he mentioned they're going to go to new venues. Uh, he talks about how they're you know, excited to go back to the venues that sold out, um, as well as even hinted for the first time um, possibly some expansion teams coming. So... Let's start with the expansion aspect of it, Adam. Do you think it's too soon, or do you think it's necessary for them to add maybe two teams next year? I can't see why uh, it would be a negative. If you looked at the player pool that was uh, put out on a weekly basis, there were some fantastic players um, available every single week. I mean, the team that went to the championship ha had a guy like Clark Peterson not dressing uh, for rem most of the second half of the season, and he, he lit it up for the first few games. We were curious if he was going to be um, a breakout star for them at the beginning of the year. So um, as long as the league continues to stay super competitive, um, which I 100% believe, and will continue to infuse new talent um, from this next year's draft class, I don't see why it couldn't expand uh, going into year two. I at first was hesitant. I, th I thought, you know... They should at least give it one more year with these squads, not to have to break them up. But as you mentioned, there's such a wealth of talent in the player pool. They might only have to take two or three guys off these teams um, to make two more teams, you know? I definitely think, you know, they want to be careful with it. But based on how the leagues run, it's not like you're adding two new franchises. The league owns all the teams, so it's very easy logistically to add. Um, it's just whether you have enough talent and, you know, if some of these guys come over from the MLL, which is a reality of the fact, um, you know, they'll have some more like that, say a Lyle or a Rob Pinnell. You know, it's definitely a possibility. And for right now, we personally think the writing's on the wall for both of those guys to come join next year uh, once their MLL contracts are up. But, um, you know, we can't speak for them. That's just speculation at this point. But, you know, I definitely think there is enough players to make two more teams. So, um, yeah, I'm excited to see what they, the announcements they have coming up. Um, you know, I'm hoping it, it maybe is expansion. I got a little excited and actually uh, earlier in the season created an article that we just reposted of some expansion team ideas. So I have four up there. Let me know what you think. Uh, if you think they should go in a different direction, no harm, no foul. But I, I had a little bit of fun creating some logos and some team names uh, for some possible expansion teams. I think the biggest thing you want to touch on, Adam, is the off season, and we still don't know a lot of that. So what are you hoping that we get from this off season for the PLL? I think I'm just looking for a little bit of clarity going into next year, and uh, that in a bunch of ways, to be honest with you. And it's it's just because the newness of the league is still there that we we we're just curious about a few things. And one is player movement, right? Uh, we don't know if these were one year contracts with their with their current teams. Uh, were they multiple year deals? Who's making the deals uh, going forward in terms of um, coaching situations, in terms of uh, that player movement side of things right now? Obviously, we know that the, the coaches are uh, the GMs of the, of the various teams. And um, if a coaching change were to happen, which I don't expect going into next year, um, who makes that decision and, and how does that position get filled? Um, but the player movement one is, is the big one for me. And other leagues um, w where we've seen expansion, the teams have the opportunity to protect a certain amount of players. Um, and I'm curious if, that, if that's what route the PLL is going to go in this offseason. Um, the player movement side of things, coaching status, um, and where they go from there in terms of the free agency process is the two big ones that I'm, I'm really going to hone in on and look for news coming soon. And I think the, the underlying thing with that, too, is uh, we don't know if these players' contracts, first off, we don't know what the details of their contracts are and whether they're with the league specifically or with a team. But I assume it's with the league itself. So that's another tricky thing is it, um, you know, their contracts just stay on the books with the league and then they're free to be able to trade it, you know, in terms of just whichever team. And right now what we got from the first year, it was only trading players and draft picks. Um, but... It'd be interesting, 
you know, down the road if salaries come into play a little bit more. Yep. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely see, uh, you know, and um, that'd be something great we would like to talk to Paul about. You know, we have plans to hopefully have him on uh, this off season. Um, so hopefully we can get some more answers for you guys, and hopefully, you know, the PLL uh, is open and, uh, you know, ready to share that with us because we're definitely excited to hit the ground running with, in terms of the off season. Yep. Um, but with that, you know, that wraps up our, our recap of the championship game. Uh, before we, we move on, I just want to give a bunch of shout-outs to a lot of the great people I met this weekend. Um, and, I, you know, I just enjoyed meeting so many other content creators out there. Obviously, I was with Tom Walton, uh, who does our videography work. Um, you know, I met Alex of Whips Nation, uh, Edward, who runs Chrome Cavalry, so they run some of the fan accounts. Joe Keegan, who is a freelance writer with the PLL, you see all of his breakdowns and analysis. Um, so it was a, a pleasure meeting him. Um, and Matt Kinnear of Inside Lacrosse was also a great guy that I, I met. You know, I can keep going down the list. Kicks by Carly, who's done a lot of that custom apparel you saw for Jules Henningberg and Jared Newman. Uh, Matthew Curtis, who does our social media, he came all the way up from Georgia. Um, he, you'll know, recognize him better as the guy who painted the R and RJ on his chest when they were down in Atlanta um, for RJ. And then the entire Whip Snakes Maryland tailgate was phenomenal. We stopped by them and shout out to Bryce Young's family. They had the Whip Stakes sign. They were also a pleasure to meet. Um, they were really excited about the game. Um, you could definitely hear them in the stands cheering for uh, Bryce and the Whip Snakes. Barstool Jordy as well. I, I briefly ran into him. Another great guy. They, they had a phenomenal live podcast. If you guys were able to listen to that, whether in person or uh, you know over the air. Um, but they, they did a great job with that, I thought, too. So a lot of great guys that I met, um, and you know I'm looking forward to meeting more people as we go into the off season um, and into next season. But with that, let's uh, go to a, a quick break, um, hear a word from our sponsor, and then we'll dive into the fantasy lacrosse, announce our fantasy lacrosse winner as well. Hey everyone, thank you for listening to another episode of the Pro Lacrosse Talk podcast. We've been using Anchor for our podcast since the very start. Anchor gives you everything you need in one place, and better yet, it's free. They allow you to easily record and edit your podcast so it sounds great, and send it out to all the major networks such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and many more. Better yet, they connect you with advertisers so you can start making money from your podcast right away. So if you're interested in starting a podcast, download the Anchor app today or go to anchor.fm to get started. All right, welcome back. It's time for your fantasy lacrosse fix now. Before we announce the winning roster from this week three, as well as our grand prize winner who will receive those epic all-star game lacrosse gloves, uh, let's go down some of the top performers. So at faceoff, again, Stephen Kelly came out firing all cylinders. He had 10 points, and he benefited greatly from not having to face Trevor Baptiste. Some other big performers from the attack Marcus Holman with 8 points, and Will Manny, of course, with 11.5 points after his record-setting day. And Matt Cavanaugh had 6.5 points as well. Um, and we cannot forget uh, Mr. MVP himself, Matt Rambo, who finished out with 6 points on the day. At the midfield, uh, Mike Chanichuk had 3. Uh, Brent Adams had 3.5. As well as Sergio Perkovic, who had that big 2-pointer in the Redwoods game. He had 3.5. So any of those guys uh, got you a good amount of points as well from the midfield. On defense, you had two archers had big days, and that would be Scott Ratliff with five and a half, and Mike Simon with four and a half, as well as Whip Snakes defender Tim Muller, who had four on the day. So if you had any of those guys, uh, they ended up getting you the most for your defensive players. And then finally, at goalie, top performer of the day was Kyle Burnlore with five and a half, and Adam Gittleman with five and a half. So those were your big performers. Um, some disappointments: Jack and Cannon got you negative half a point if you had him starting. Um, at the faceoff, Joe Nardella only got two and a half. You know, we kind of expected a bigger day from him in this championship. And at attack, Jules Henningberg uh, laid a goose egg in this game. Um, but overall, uh, a fun weekend to end our fantasy lacrosse for the PLL. Now to announce our winner for week three, it is Arrowheads with 56 points. Coming in a close second was Fields of Dreams with 50.5 and Max Lax, who had 47.5. But yeah, Arrowheads... Uh, came away with a victory in week three, and his team was just stacked. He really picked a good squad this week. He had, for his attack, Marcus Holman, Matt Cavanaugh, and Will Manny. Midfield, Connor Kelly, Mike Chanichuk, Paul Rabel. Defense, Garrett Eppel, Michael Earhart, and Scott Ratliff. Face-off, Stephen Kelly. And in net, Kyle Burnlore. So he comes away with our week three victory. And 
His dominant performance in week three actually puts him over the edge for our grand prize as well. So congratulations to Arrowheads for the grand prize. His grand total was 128. The person next behind him was Fields of Dreams and Bossy Laxers, both with 118.5. Um, and CG Trojans, who was our week one winner, had 115. So that's your top four. Thank you guys so much for playing. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, it was a blast you know, running the league, and we're hoping that we can do some more fantasy lacrosse-related games in the future. Um, but that wraps up our PLL Fantasy Talk. Um, so let's go to another quick break, and then we'll get back into our MLL recaps. All right, welcome back. So congratulations again to our winners. Um, but let's go into this MLL games from this past weekend. Uh, the seeding is now set. Um, but let's start off with the Friday night game uh, with Colin Heacock, who had a huge night. He you know, had four goals and one assist. What did you think of this game, Adam? This may be a preview of what the championship looks like. I think these are two uh, of the teams that have been most playing the most um, competitive ball lately for, for the MLL and the most consistent. Uh, that seems kind of ironic to say the uh, uh, Outlaws have been playing consistent considering that, that up and down time period they had maybe closer to the middle of the season. Um, but really strong effort. I will say um, it's not what the playoff team uh, for Denver is going to look like. They had nine players missing, whether they were playing for in the indoor championships or were just injured. They were missing their starting goalie, starting faceoff man, and two, three of their top scorers. So um, it was a really great effort for, for the squad that they did have Christian Knight start in his first game in cage, uh, first professional start for the Outlaws. So um, really fun game to watch in front of a big crowd. They, they reported about 16,000 fans that were at the game. So um, super exciting uh, game for, for a regular season end. Um, I will point out a big guy missing for uh, the Bayhawks was, was Lyle Thompson, uh, who did get injured uh, while playing for the Iroquois in the World Games. So um, that'll be something to look uh, for in the playoffs, whether he will be able to uh, suit up for the Bayhawks going into the semifinals. Because uh, to be honest, that'll change my opinion of who wins that first round game. Um, and another big point is that uh, Brian Phipps had his third starting cage, uh, making 13 saves for, for the Bayhawks. So um, looks like he will be their starter going forward. Um, is when in these playoffs. So a couple big topics that will really affect um, kind of the nuances of the playoffs going forward. Yeah, you mentioned that Lyle injury, and it's a real shame about that injury, um, especially considering he was only five points away from tying Rob Pinnell's uh, record for most points in a season. Um, but, you know, like you hit on, even more important is the playoffs right around the corner. So, uh, you know, hopefully he'll be good to go, and, you know, we're going to be breaking down uh, the playoffs and what, who we think is going to win next week in our podcast. So um, we're not going to do that today. But, yeah, definitely interesting and something to look out for. So we hope he, you know, we wish him the best with his MRI. Um, but let's go to the, the next game. The Rattlers looked, you know, to end the season on a high note, uh, and they, they took on the Cans this weekend. And uh, they end up, you know, getting the 15-16 victory. They end up getting the 16-15 to victory. But what did you see from this game, Adam? Yeah, a, another fun one to watch. You know, both teams uh, really came out to play a pretty high-scoring first half uh, for both squads. Um, One-point game going into the second half with the with the Cannons leading, but strong strong efforts from both sides. Um, it's pretty crazy to think that um, how the season ended. Uh, the fact that the Rats only missed the playoffs by one game and basically how the standings broke. You know, one more win against the Blaze would have been the difference between them being in the playoffs and the blaze missing the playoffs so um it, it comes to show uh it goes to show that every week uh in in professional lacrosse really means a lot and um but you had a really strong effort um by both squads uh bryce wasserman um came out to play three had three goals on the day um bradley voigt who's up for rookie of the year um had two so really well-rounded effort by by uh, dallas squad who has a lot to look forward to uh, for next year. I'm assuming most of those uh, players will be coming back. Um, but, I mean, the, the, big, the big point uh, of the day was Sean Scannone, uh, who came up with a pretty absurd uh, 24 saves on the day, uh, only letting in 15 goals, so on almost 40 shots. So really great effort uh, to end the season for a team that uh, I'll be looking forward to watching next year going forward. 
Yeah, no, you know, obviously a, a big win for the Rattlers to end the season on a high note. And again, Sean Scannoni had a phenomenal day. We're going to talk about him a little bit later when we talk about our MLL awards. But, you know, I, I, disappointing the way the Cannons ended, but they, they didn't have uh, Morocco in. They had Tate Boyce. He made his first career start in the MLL. Uh, he did fine, but I think they were kind of, you know, resting some guys. And I think they're, they're still in good shape, only losing by one. So I'm not too worried about them, but I think they definitely would have liked to get a win and um, you know a chance for that top seed so falling to nine and seven definitely uh, hurt them in that regard and they'll have to take on the outlaws who I think is a, a much tougher matchup than say uh, the blaze are looking right now but let's get into that blaze game uh, that you know they also end the season on a sour note um, tell me what you saw from this one yeah it was a pretty disappointing effort to be honest with you um, from, from a, a team uh, that was playing the last place team in, in the league in the Lizards and Austin Cowden Cage, if, if you saw, he had a, uh, a top 10 play for SportsCenter and it just so happened to be him scoring a goal, which was, which was pretty awesome to watch. Yeah, 70 yards. He went like the full field. It was ridiculous. So I, that, was, that was awesome to see. Um, I didn't get to watch that game live, but you know I watched the highlights and seeing that make top 10. It's, it's always great when you see lacrosse, no matter what league, in the top 10 for Sports Center, And, you know, that's how our sport's going to grow if we get more top plays like that. Yeah, and, and you saw the, the top guys for the Lizards, who they were all year, come out and perform really strongly. Rob Pinnell had five and three for eight. Uh, Dylan Malloy had five on the day with four goals. So um, the usual sus suspects for um, the, the Lizards. And then for on the other side of things, the Blaze, uh, Christian Mazzoni came out uh, and had six goals uh, on the day on seven shots, uh, which was pretty pretty crazy. And uh, I, it just didn't seem like it was clicking um, in a, a number of ways for, for specifically the defensive side of the ball when it came uh, to the the blaze you know they had two keepers play chris madelon played a half and max edelman both played uh, a half um so they they were they were trying some things out going into the uh playoffs um but i i'm not worried about the offense for for the blaze it's really on that defensive side of the ball um which we've talked about in, in previous weeks you know tommy palasek had a great day had eight points with five and three so uh, the offensive outputs there it's just it's going to come down to if they're going to, if the Blaze are going to be able to shut some teams down and, and have some strong play in net. In net. Yeah, no, I, I think they're going to really just have to outshoot some of these teams because um, you know, the defense has kind of been their Achilles heel all year. And, you know, again, you know, I, I know I talked about Madelon. Um, you know, he, he statistically had a good season, but I don't think he's been as clutch as he could be, you know, if we're ignoring the stat sheet. Um but I don't know if Edelman's, you know, the, the answer either. You know, I think you got to go with your proven starter. And I know they're trying to mix things up before the, the playoffs, but I think it's a little too late, you know. I don't know. Are they going to do a goalie tandem, you know, in the playoffs? I, I just, I don't know. I, I feel like you go back to Madelon, and I know I, I was critical of him last week. Um, but, again, he, he has actually had statistically a solid year. I just think he hasn't been as clutch as he's needed to be. And it's really on these poles um, and the close defenders to kind of, you know, get some of these stops because, again, we've seen that these, this team can score. You know, you got Brian Cole, Tommy Palasek, Randy Stotts, Shane Jackson, uh -huh, Mark Matthews, so many weapons on the offensive side of the ball, and they have a solid, you know, face-off guy um, in Alex Woodall. But, you know, it's, it's going to come down to that defense, and like you said, if they can come up with some stops, they can be dangerous. But, if, but from what we've seen, it, you know, it, it doesn't look like it's, they're going in with a lot of steam into these playoffs. But, you know, that kind of wraps up this weekend. We'll have a, a better breakdown and, um, you know, preview for these playoff games come next week for our next week's podcast. The semifinals will be on October 4th, which is a Friday, and the championship will be on October 6th. Both are in Denver. Um, but let's get into these MLL awards. So we voted last week, um, and they announced today the finalists. So we'll give you guys what our picks were, and then we'll also choose – a finalist if one of our picks was not end up being a finalist because it was fan voting and now they will vote now they will have an association vote on these finalists so our finalist for the coca-cola mvp is mark hockton of the cannons lyle thompson of the bayhawks and zach courier of the outlaws so adam who do you think is deserving of the mvp award you no know, all, all strong players 
Mark Cockerton was came out with the award last year after a fan one of his uh, after a career year, but uh, I don't think you can give it to anyone other than Lyle Thompson. He's arguably the best player uh, field player in the world right now. Whether you're talking about PLL or MLL, um, such a fantastic season was so close to breaking Rob Pinnell's uh, record for most points in a season. I think if he hadn't missed a few games early and, and this past um, game due to injury um, he would have broken that record so you have to give it to Thompson based off of the statistical season and just how dominant he's been all year yeah I have to agree you know 46 goals 27 assists for 73 points um, you mentioned five shy of tying Pinnell's record so yeah kudos to him I think he deserves it as well and that brings us to our offensive player of the year uh, the finalists for that are Randy Stotts of the Blaze, Mark Hockshin again of the Cannons, and then again Lyle Thompson of the Chesapeake Bayhawks. So are you giving this award to Thompson as well based on his offensive production, or are you going in a different direction? Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, after we talked, um, you know, looking back and how I decided to put my votes in for uh, the PLL awards, I kind of felt silly that I, I gave Rambo the MVP. Uh, and didn't give him the the best attackman. So I'm definitely going uh, with Lyle Thompson in this one. Best offensive player. He had the best season statistically. Uh, you got to go with him. Yeah, I'm going again with Thompson. You know, based on what we said before, I think it's a no-brainer. And you're doing, uh, you know, him in the league a disservice if you don't vote for him as offensive player as well. But that brings us to our defensive player of the year. Um, the finalists for this are Liam Burns of the Blaze, Rylan Reese of the Cannons and Finn Sullivan of the Outlaws. Who do you think was the best defender of the MLL this year? You know, I got to go with uh, the number two overall pick in, in this past week's NLL draft, uh, Rylan Reese from the Boston Cannons. Had a fantastic season for them. Um, we actually were able to interview him um, at the NLL draft last week. So give a listen to that when you get a chance. But he had a fantastic season with the Cannons um, in a variety of ways. Was tied with uh, another candidate for uh, this uh, award, uh, Liam Burns, uh, in ground balls this year. So it led all defensemen in GBs with 63 ground balls on the season. So really strong uh effort for him. His team is going into the playoffs, so I'm looking forward to watching him forward, but he'd have to be my pick for Defensive Player of the Year. Yeah, I'm going to go with the other guy who was tied for ground balls for defenseman and Liam Burns. Not only did he lead the league in uh, ground balls uh, as a defender, but he also led the league in cause turnovers with 30. So he's my pick uh, for the Defender of the Year. I, I wish that Atlanta could clone him, because um, if they had more Liam Burns, I think they'd be a much better team. Unfortunately, he's the only one out there, but Again, he, he had a phenomenal year, um, and just based on those statistics and kind of what I've seen from him on the, the field, I have to go with him. And after that, that brings us to our Brian Goalie of the Year Award. Uh, the finalists for this, Chris Mallon, Sean Scannoni, and Dylan Ward, uh, three really great goalies. What, who do you think should win this one, though, Adam? Uh, you know, I think he's, he's not a finalist. He was in the uh, finalist for the, the uh fan voting and Nick Morocco had a fantastic season he was even week 15 defensive player of the week for the league um, really strong um, you know there were up and downs for the cannons all year but Nick Morocco whether it was big save after big save was coming up huge for them um, in a variety of, of areas so he won them a few games single-handedly which helped them get to the playoffs so um, Dylan Ward and, and Chris Madelon uh, uh, had all right seasons. I, I think you're going to go with the third finalist here. Um, but even if he wasn't the best, I think he should have been in this final three. Yeah, no, I, I think what it gets lost on Morocco is the quality of his saves. Like you said, he had so many highlight plays uh, where it's either point blank or he's diving across the net to make. Um, and, you know, that's something you, you can't really quantify. Um, you know, he was right there with Madelon and, and Ward around 50% save percentage. So uh, definitely a solid pick. Um, but I'm going with Sean Scannoni, the rookie. You know, he had the best save percentage of all these goalies with 55.63%. Um, and, and once he earned that starting job with Dallas, you know, he never really looked back. And he was monumental in their season turnaround. So um, I'm going to go with Scannoni in this one. And, uh, you know, as a finalist, I hope he ends up winning uh, this award. And now our finalists for Tito's Coach of the Year Award. We have Sean Quirk of the Boston Cannons, Dave Cottle of the Chesapeake Bayhawks, and Tony Seaman of the Denver Outlaws. Adam, who do you think deserves Coach of the Year? 
You know, th this is a, a real tough one for me. But you got to go with Bill Warder, how, how the season uh, was really transformed for him. You know, most teams uh, would have been pretty distraught with the, the start of a season they had. Um, but to, to reel off seven wins in, in nine games uh, is something to be said about um, how he was able to kind of rally that locker room uh, and continue the success. So, um, or start that success that that got them to seven wins. So uh, I got to go with Bill Warder. Fantastic job. Really excited to see what the Rats do next year. Yeah, no, Bill Warder was also who I voted for. Um, you know, unfortunately, he did not make the finalists because, um, you know, I would have loved to see him win it too. I, I think you hit the nail on the head with him turning the season around. Yeah. And I don't think the Rattlers had that much talent. Obviously, they, you know, he started to go with Scannoni, which was a big move, and they picked up Voigt, you know, from the player pool. But, um, so they obviously added a little bit of talent, but I still don't, you know, think they're a young team, uh, inexperienced, uh, you know, and I think he really set a tone and created a culture for Dallas. Um, and we were really worried about that team early on. So yeah, I would have given him coach of the year too. Um, unfortunately he's not a finalist. Um, so if I had to choose between the finalists, I'd probably go with uh, Sean Quirk just because he's gotten the cannons to be you know, consistent throughout the year. Other than that big blowout from the Outlaws a few weeks ago, they never lost by more than three goals. Um, so I, I think that kind of shows, you know, how he's gotten his team to play at a level and kind of play consistently at that level. Um, so I think they're poised to make a run. I know they lost last week, um, but, you know, they're a team that I, I wouldn't sleep on in this. And, you know, Dave Cottle and Tony Seaman are also some great coaches as well. But I think they have a lot more talent on that roster. Not that the Cannons aren't talented. You know, you got Kyle Jackson, Mark Cockerton, uh, we all obviously talked about Nick Morocco and Cage. You know, they're obviously a talented squad as well, but um, just looking at the caliber of guys you have on the Bayhawks and the Outlaws, I think they had a little bit more to work with, you know, given, you know, the Outlaws were missing a bunch of guys last week, uh, and, you know, they still had a bunch of guys that they could still start. Um, I think, it, you know, it's not as much of a problem. So that's why if I have to pick a finalist, uh, I'll pick Sean Quirk, but I'm with you with Bill Warder getting snubbed here. And then our final award uh, that had that, our final player, and then our final award that involved player voting was the Cascade Rookie of the Year award. Um, so the finalists with this are Alex Woodall, Justin Pugel, and Chris Aslanian. Who do you think is deserving of the Rookie of the Year? Yeah, I got to go with Alex Woodall. You know, he had a fantastic first season. Um, was arguably the most dominant faceoff guy in the MLL this year. Broke numerous ground ball records, season uh, records for for the Blaze this year. So, a really strong candidate. Um, seems like he great made the right move to go with the MLL in, in terms of his dominance this year. So, uh, I got to give it to the Towson grad in Woodall. Yeah, no, I definitely make a good. You definitely make a good case for Woodall. Um, I honestly think Sean Scannoni got snubbed from this. I, you know, he was my goalie of the year pick, and I, I think he deserves rookie of the year, honestly, of this group. Um, he was not a finalist, unfortunately, and that's where I think, you know, the player voting could be a little bit lacking because you can definitely argue that some of these teams like the Outlaws, Cannons, and Bayhawks are more popular than, say, the Rattlers. Um, so, you know, I don't know if that played a part into him not becoming a finalist, but he was my choice for... Uh, rookie of the year, but if I had to pick one of these finalists, I'd go as Lanyon. You know, he had a phenomenal year for Denver, um, really came into his own, and, you know, he, he earned a spot on that roster. Um, you know, he had, had a lot of big days, and he finished the season with 42 points in 14 games, so, you know, pretty solid output for a rookie. I think if he has a big day, you know, come playoff time, he could be pivotal for this Outlaws team, so he's my choice of the finalists. And then finally, we have Two more awards that were not um, that did not involve fan voting, um, and that's the annual Dave Huntley Man of the Year award. Um, that is going to be announced and given to the player that demonstrated outstanding sportsmanship, professionalism, and service to this community. Um, but my choice for that, even though we know we obviously don't get to vote, uh, I have to go with Colin Heacock. Just having been to a Bayhawks game and seeing how he's the last person to leave, always signing autographs. Um, very involved in the Baltimore Chesapeake area community. Uh, you know, obviously he, he, he grew up in that area. He went to Boys Latin. Um, so I think he enjoys being, you know, a hometown guy. And, uh, you know, I have to give him give him this award if, if I had a vote. Yeah, you're spot on with Heacock. You know, um, when, when the season started and the MLL rebranded, uh, he really was the face of the league if, if you looked at all of their... Um, 
promotional, uh, all of their promos and whatnot. And uh, he really did live up to that when, when it came to fan um, interaction. And just his uh, personality w was fantastic to see him interact with fans. So absolutely a good choice in Colin Heacock. Yep, so that, that's your MLL awards. There's also the Maverick Players' Choice Award, which will be given out to the player um, voted by the Major League Lacrosse players. Um, we don't have a choice for that because we're not players, so we'll leave that up to them. Um, but let's go into how we did in our game picks this past weekend, Adam. Uh, how did it look this week for both of us? Yep, so uh, we both were two and three um, for a bunch of different reasons. You got uh, the big... I think if there was a tiebreaker, you probably would be in first place since you picked uh, the PLL championship correct. Uh, but we go into the MLL playoffs, um, both with a 42 and 36 record. Um, and I'm excited to chat next week during our playoff preview for the MLL on who our picks will be and who will uh, basically decide uh, the champion for not only the MLL, uh, but the inaugural game pick championship. Yeah, no, it's going to come down to three games. Um, and you said you would give me the tiebreaker on the championship, but... Actually, the two games that we both uh, guessed correctly different from each other, I guessed the Whip Snakes, you guessed the Rattlers, two snake teams, and uh, they each only won by one. So I think it was as close as you can get this week, if you had to ask me. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't want it any other way. I think it's great that it's going to come down to the final week uh, of who buys the other lunch. Um, I'm already thinking about, you know, where I'd like to eat, and hopefully you're thinking somewhere in mine too. Um, and uh, I'm really hoping I get lunch on you next week but yeah that wraps up uh, this episode um, before we let you guys go we'd like to read an apple review that we received uh, recently on our podcast page so our review is from buddy booker uh, his review is titled great lacrosse podcast and he says as a lifelong player and a lover of lacrosse this podcast is everything i've been craving for in a sports podcast great hosts and great conversations so thank you buddy booker for your review we appreciate it um if you guys have similar thoughts, you know, please give us a review on Apple or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts. We really appreciate your feedback, but that's all the time we have for today. Uh, so before we wrap up, Adam, let's go into overtime. What are you looking forward to most this weekend with no lacrosse actually on? I, I honestly don't know what I'm going to do without lacrosse this weekend. You know, I might do a deep dive uh, in the NLL draft. Uh, looking at, at that that a little bit and look out on our website for, for some content uh, regarding the NLL draft. So that's probably what I'll be doing this weekend uh, is doing a little bit writing for the site and, and looking at uh, the future, uh, the next season, which will be the indoor league. I myself will also be doing some writing on that, um, as well as writing my Give and Go Foundation article that I've been working hard on all year and kind of stalled a little bit on it. But I'm looking forward to finishing that. You know, Scott Ratliff and Adam Gittleman have done great things with that foundation. So I kind of want to shine a spotlight on that so you guys can look for both our articles in the next coming weeks. So that wraps up episode 24, though. Thank you guys all for listening. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope you tune in next time to Pro Lacrosse Talk.